Hey, it's Sofing Student here, and today I want to talk about Java Collections. So, Java Collection is a framework, which means it is some classes and interfaces which we can import and then use in our programming. And I will today be talking about lists, sets, maps, and stacks and queues. So first, I'll just explain the basics of our lists. So our lists are kind of improved version, at least in some ways, of the array in Java, where the list is just simply like an array. We can create some kind of list of anything, and we can just keep adding stuff, and we don't need to worry about the size, where with a um, Java array, we need to define a max capacity, and we then can't change that. We then need to create a new array, and then shift everything from the old array to the new array if we want to increase the size which is actually technically what our array list is just doing for us. When we create an empty array list, we get an empty array. Find out, this is how we can think of it. Then when we add stuff, we add numbers to our array and it figures out the position itself. And then at some point when our array is close to be full, the array list would automatically just create a new array that's larger with a percentage of something else odd can't remember exactly how it's implemented, but creates a new array and then shifts all our old numbers in this case to a new array with more space. And in this case, we can add numbers infinitely and we don't need to worry about the space of our array. We then also have our linked list, which is a different implementation of our list. So you need to think of lists like the basic capability, just having something, which is just an interface, so you can't create an object of our interface. We need to either do a specific kind of list, as mentioned, our array list or our linked list, where our linked list is a bit different from our array list, where our array list used arrays to create size of our lists. Our linked list is using kind of like, think of them like objects, where each of these objects contains a number. So let's say we had a linked list and we added a number. So first we have a header object, which tells us where to begin with our linked list. We then have our first object. So let's say we added an object. So we did our numbers. Let's just come this out to remove any confusion. We have our numbers, which is just a list. And now we're specifying that our numbers is a linked list. We would then do numbers dot add one, the exact same way as we would do with the array list, and that's also why often it can be quite confusing at first the difference between an array list and a linked list because the implement like the way we use them is the exact same, but the main difference is actually how they're implemented and then what they can be used for, or more or less how they work in specific situations. So our linked list, we first get a number one. We then now have our header pointing at where we begin with all these numbers. So later on, we have multiple numbers. For now, just header pointing at one. And this one then is an object that contains the number and information about where the next number is in the list. Why the name linked list? So we have these links between elements. And when we then add another number, so for example, our number one object is now pointing that the next number in the list is two. So here, the main advantage of using the linked list over our array list is that it is faster in manipulating data. So let's say in an array list, we have a bunch of numbers. That's some empty spaces. And we want to remove one number in the middle, three, for example. We now have an empty spot, which is not appropriate. So we need to move everything down. One needs to be moved down, move down, move down, move down, and we're done. But all this moving takes a lot of capability. It's a lot of moving just for moving one number. Where with our manipulating data with our linked list, let's say we move the number two, we can just simply move this component and have our object one pointing to number three in this case. And I think I forgot to mention that the last number, so now it would be two, so let's say we had this. 
setup, our last number is pointing at null. That's the way we know it's the last number in our array list, our linked list. And but the conclusion is it's quicker in manipulation when removing data in the middle of our linked list because we can then just take this object out and change where it is pointing. I hope it made some sense because at first, at least definitely to me, linked lists were quite confusing. And it's very confusing at first to understand why we have both an array list and a linked list because they work the exact same way when we're just doing some low level programming. But when we get some a lot of numbers later on and we need to do some manipulation, it actually at some point might matter if you choose an array list or a linked list. So next let's talk a bit about our set. So sets are kind of similar to a list, but the main difference from a list to a set is that our set can only contain one copy of each element. So we don't have any duplicates. And of sets, we have two kinds. We have a hash set and a tree set, which is the first time we're going to be introducing this tree component, which at first, so quite a few people also seem a bit confusing. What does it mean? But just very simply, a set is just a normal set that contains just a list of numbers where we don't have any duplicates. And the position of each number is completely random, where in a list, we are using an index. So they have a position in our list, a specific position where our list is just completely random. We just contain the numbers. We don't care about the position of the numbers at all. So if the position of the numbers are important, you can't use a set, you need to use a list. But a set, if you just want to have some set of numbers with no duplicates. And let me just first showcase that we have a create a set first called number set. We then create a specific number set hash set. We then add some numbers and I then print my set. And I would then showcase that the position of these numbers are completely random and even more random than you might think, because it's not even how we input them. So it's not 21st because we added 21st. It is completely random. We have 3, 20, 22, 12, 45, and whatever. Then if instead of using a hash set, we use our tree set. So now, instead of having our number set being a hash set, it is now a tree set. We then add the numbers again in the same order. And we then print the set. But now they are sorted. So we had 3, 12, 20, 22, 45. And the way we are sorting stuff is because our integer object is implementing what's called a comparable interface, which is an interface where we define how any object should be sorted which also allow us if we created a custom object, so not just a class of anything like a person, and we wanted these persons, these people to be sorted by the age, for example, we could implement a comparable interface and then define in a method, which we would overwrite from the comparable interface that these people would be sorted by the age. So if you want to know more, you should search for comparable information. Look up the comparable interface. It's, it's pretty simple and very interesting. And it allows us to quite quickly, if we have like a huge set, just define how they should be sorted and then put them into a tree set and now it's sorted. So that's the main difference by between our hash set and our tree set. Hash set, completely random, our tree set sorted based on how the object have been defined inside our class for the setup, how they should be sorted. We then have a map, which is a bit different from our lists and our sets. In the way that our map work with we have two values we have a key value or a key and a value where our key points to our value so let's say for example we create a new map just call it map not very creative we then again have a hash map or a tree map in the same with way with our sets we can have something where they're randomly positioned or where they are sorted it might make, make less difference in the set, but it's the same way. Again, unsorted or sorted, and they work the exact same way. But let me just showcase with our map. So we add a key and a value. So now I just created this map using key and value, integers and strings. 
so we map between, in this case, the integer of a number 10 and the string of 10. I could then just print my map. Let's cover this out so we don't get any more confusion. So we have our map. 1 is equal to 1, 2 is equal to 2, and so on. And this allows us to do map dot get. We can then use our key values, our keys to get our values. So let's say I want to get 10. And I now get 10 as a string. So that's kind of how we use hash maps or maps in general. We have some kind of keys and some corresponding values. But as I just showcased, when we print our map as a hash map, we get 1, 2, 3, 22, 10, which is random. But if we move this down and do it again as a tree map, they would be sorted 1, 2, 3, 10, 22. So that's the main difference between our hash map and our tree map. Rather than that, they are sorted. But they work in the exact same way where we could do map dot get 10 and we get 10 as a string. So the main difference between our hash map is this rather than that they are sorted. Then last but not least, we're going to talk a bit about stacks and queues, which at first again might seem a bit confusing, but it's actually quite, quite simple. So at least when you get the concepts. So let's first talk a bit about a stack. So a stack is kind of like a an array, you could think. Let's say, so we have these stacks. We have a stack called integer stack, which is just a new stack. And we then add some numbers to our stack. Let's not add that yet. So we add some numbers and in, for now, the order actually matters quite a bit. So first we add one. But down here, we'll be adding the numbers to my stack. I add one, I add two, and I add three. So in the stack, it is called what we would say LIFO, which means last in, first out. So when we are looking at the stack, we are looking here. So we're looking at the last input. So the main two methods we would use on our stack is called peak and pop, where peak is very simply get the peak value, the top value, which in this case is three. So we get three when we call integer stack the peak. We need to think of our stack like actually like a stack of paper, where at the bottom we add one, then two on top, and then three on top. And then when we look at the peak content of our stack, which is the three, which is on top of the stack. We can then also call pop, which gets us our top value, our peak value, but also pops the stack, which means remove the top value. So then we now first call integer stack pop, get the value three and remove it. And we then call integer stack peak, we get two. So what we're doing, is we're looking at our stack like from this way. We take three, we pop it, we get it, we remove it, and now our peak is two. And if we move this one, it'd be back to one. But what I was about to do before, so let's say we do one, two, three, we pop it, we remove three, we look at the peak, which is two, we then add another value, let's do to five. And we then look at the, the peak. We would then get five. Because what we're doing is we have one, two, three. We then remove three, get three, print two, and we then add five on top of our stack. And when we then call peak, we still get five. So when we keep adding stuff, newly stuff added is what would be out first. Last in, first out. We then have our queue, which kind of works in the opposite way. Comment this out. So where our stack was last in, first out, our queue is just like any normal queue in the real world, where first in, first out. So we have a queue, it's a queue, 
we had one, two, three. One, two, three. We then can call peak again, which in this case looks at the peak value. So we added one, two, three. Let's see what our peak value will be. It is one, because last in, first in, first out. So in this case, one is our peak value. And where we could do pop on our stack, we can do pull on our queue. We're like pulling the first value out and then peaking. So in this case, we would get the value one, remove the value one, and then our peak is a value two. And now, if we did integer q dot add, let's do four, and then did our print line, integer q dot peak, we will still get two, because first in, first out. So even though we added another number, four, we're still having two as our peak. So this was the main concept of Java collections I wanted to talk about today. We have our lists, our sets, our maps, and our queues and our stacks. So I hope this helped get a better understanding of why we use Java collections and the main functionalities of this framework. If you did enjoy this video, please leave a like and subscribe, and I wish you all a wonderful day.